Good morning or afternoon, whenever you're watching this. This is Mr. Walker bringing the knowledge about America after World War II. So we're talking the end of the 40s, rolling into mostly going to be covering the 50s today. All right, so we're going to take a look at how the war, World War II, impacted our economy, as well as how do we respond to a fear of communism. Let's begin. All right, so... Uh, things you should be able to know is identify how the Red Scare of the 1950s and the fear of communism shaped American politics in the 1950s. Explain why the Red Scare impacted not only political aspects of the U.S., but also our culture. Identify the impact of Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin and what he had on the Red Scare. And assess how much American politics and cultures were influenced by the Red Scare and communism. Here we go. All right, so the beginning part, this is going to look like, you know, new comforts and new forms of entertainment during the post-war economic boom, yet I do want to point out that millions continue to live in poverty and uh, despite the success of the 50s, there are still major racial gaps. All right, following the war, we have a housing shortage because remember, uh, when we went into the war, it was the Great Depression, so people didn't have a lot of money, there was not a lot of houses being built. Uh, soldiers come back, they saved up all their money and all their pay from the military because they've been fighting the entire time, they can't really be spending it. They come back, they can afford a house, but there's not enough houses for everyone. Plus, you know, women and wives were working uh, the home front jobs, and so they were saving that money too, and they, have, they can afford housing, okay? Um, so in order to mass produce a lot of houses, uh, the developers used the assembly line method to mass produce houses so like you're you're cutting the same board time and time and time again and you're making you know the same uh supports for the house time and time again and pretty much what you're going to do is you're going to build the same house over and over and then people are going to buy the same house all right these houses that look very similar to each other are going to be built in what are called suburbs these are small communities outside of large communities something that really helps with this is the gi bill which uh you know get provided loans for veterans it still does today it provides a uh, partial college tuition, unemployment benefits. It's just to really help uh, veterans return to civilian life so that they can get a job, they can get a house, you know, um, they can maybe go to school if that's what they want to do. All right. Well, this is Mr. Levitt, William Levitt. He is one of the people that originated the mass production technique for houses. And you can see this is his town, or they named this town after him called Levitt Town. The crazy thing is, though, he was mass producing all these homes, so all the homes look the same. Right? If you look at this house and this house, no, they are not the same uh, because this has a couple of dormers. But if you go every other house, this house is the same as this house, and this house is the same as this house. And so it goes every other house down the line, okay? This is going to add to the 50s and uh, the social conformity that happens. Conformity meaning acting and being the same, and this kind of plays into it. So, you know, social conformity, conformity meaning being the same, acting the same, um, dressing, looking the same, having the same ideas, okay? A lot of employees uh, paid people, or employers paid people very well. They had secure jobs, but you lost your individuality. They want you to, you know, work together for teamwork. They want loyalty, okay? They're encouraging conformity. You do the same thing as everyone else, okay? To be different, uh, you know, at this time, could lead you to be accused of being a communist. Not always would, but depending on some of your actions, if they weren't you know, necessarily the same or if your ideas were not the same as your friends, that could lead you to being uh, suspected of being a communist, okay? Something else about the 50s, um, you know, you guys heard the term last year, it was very popular, okay, boomer, all right? That comes from, millennials are pretty much calling their parents this because millenn most millennial parents uh, most parents of millennials are baby boomers, and baby boomers are, are all the kids born between 1945 and 1965. Due to, you know, this really good economy and people having lots of money, they started having babies, okay? And so the birth rate goes through the roof. It booms uh, between those 20 years, and so anybody born between that is considered a baby boomer, or they've been shortened to boomer, all right? They generally have conservative ideas today. Uh, their ideas or beliefs don't really match uh, the younger crowd's uh, ideas and beliefs today. All right, just to show you the social conformity, here's a classroom in the 1950s. If you take a look real quick, all the boys have the same haircut. They all have the same haircut. 
And most of them are all wearing collared shirts, all right? A shirt with a collar on it. If you look at the girls, they all have the same haircut. Little puffy bangs and then the uh, puffs on the side. Every single one of them. They look exactly the same, okay? This is crazy. And this kind of plays in with this fear of communism because you didn't want to be different than anybody else because then somebody would accuse you of being a communist, okay? This is another one, uh, another class. You can see all the girls are wearing what they call poodle skirts, okay? And all the boys are wearing collared shirts, and they all have the same haircuts. Except for this boy, he is different. He's not wearing a collared shirt. He's just wearing a straight white shirt. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Grease, okay, those are the kind of the outsider p kids, uh, the rebel kids of the 1950s. That's what this kid's going to grow up to. He's not smiling for the picture. He's not enjoying his time. He's only got a white T-shirt on. Uh, he's, you know, he's going to be a little rebel. Um, this also transcended, uh, you know, the conformity transcended not just for white people, but other minorities as well. You can see Hispanics of the 1940s and 50s here. That was kind of like an old high school picture I was able to drum up here. Um, you can see the, 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 the girls' haircuts are all the same, and they're still kind of modeled very similar to uh, the girls we just saw. And all the boys technically kind of have this same-looking haircut, okay? And they all tend to be either wearing a tie or a bow tie. Also, African Americans are. This is a this is a diverse, uh, integrated classroom picture here because you have uh, white people, African Americans, and it appears Asians as well in this. Um, but you can see, you know, even the African American males all have the same style of haircut. They're all wearing suits. Okay, the girls all still have, you know, whether they're Asian, African American, or white in this picture, they all have the same haircut. So this is a social conformity of acting the same, not trying to be an outsider, not trying to draw attention to yourself. Very different from today because we talk about individuality and issues like that today. New products, uh, this economic boom leads to consumerism, capitalism. It's very wonderful. They're making lots of money, um, and they, they're able to afford things, okay? So there's affording of new things, we call it consumerism, and you buy expensive things because if you can afford success, uh, expensive things, then you're considered successful. So new products are coming on the market, but they're also doing something called planned obsolescence, okay? Um, planned obsolescence is making a product that gets outdated or wears out. It makes the person, the buyer, want to buy a new one. Think about like Apple products. Nobody has an iPhone 5 anymore, right? Apple made it so that those become obsolete. They run too slow and you have to buy a new one. Okay, um, and so, you know, consumerism, another way to think about that is, you know, why does someone have, you know, shoes that are $300, a belt that's $200, a shirt that is, you know, $100? Because if you have all that, then that means you have money, okay? And, but this is also part of, you know, proving that uh, capitalism is better than communism. Our economy can flourish better than yours. Our people live a happier, more fulfilled life because we can afford this. And, you know, the TV comes of age in the 50s and by the end of the decade, you know, 90% of the households will have a TV. Colored TV uh, comes out in 1956, but most people don't have colored TV until the 60s. Okay, as you guys learned on the last one, the Soviets got the atomic bomb or were able to develop the atomic bomb in 1949. This actually puts America into like this kind of panic, this red scare that the Soviets were going to come and take over. So like how to protect yourself from an atomic bomb. And, you know, they kind of put out things like this to show you, like, how far away from the atomic bomb you'd have to be in order for your uh, house to be destroyed. Or if you're wearing a fedora, to tip your hat so when the flash and the heat goes by, it doesn't burn your eyes. People started, and you can still do these today, buying underground bunkers, okay? Or people buy them and put them in, and some people are finding them. It's like a blast from the past into the 50s and 60s. These are underground bunkers that you can put in underneath your house, and this is kind of what it would look like. You would go down, and, you know, if there was a, a, an atomic attack, you could be down there. They have a radio for news information, canned water, canned food, okay? This might be something to do with ventilation so they can breathe, Okay, um, so they have all the things they might need to survive down there for, you know, uh, whether it be a week or two weeks, they would try and have things so that they could survive. And these are all the potential red dots of where we might be attacked in America, okay? And most of those are either large cities or these big red dots are where we keep our nuclear weapons, okay? Uh, due to this, uh, the Soviets establishing the bomb, um, we know that they were in our Manhattan Project, our project to create the atomic bomb. So we know we have spies among us. And so um, 
the communism spreads to Eastern Europe, as you guys should have known, like the Soviets, all the countries they freed from Nazi control, they turned into communist countries. China becomes a communist country in 1950. You know, this feels the fear that communism is spreading everywhere. In America, we have the US Communist Party, there's 100,000 members. And so we're thinking that communism comes here, this fear of communism and these spies among us. And so the United States uh, House of Representatives creates this group called the House Un-American Activities Committee, or shortened to HUAC. They're investigating communist ties and influence in the movie industry. Right? They're looking at the movie industry and seeing if there's communist messages, if there's directors or writers or actors that are spilling out communist ideas into the movies. Um, ten people in Hollywood, they become known as the Hollywood Ten, they're uh, writer, director, actors. Um, they're accused of having communist ties or um, spreading communist messages in the movies and they're arrested and then they refuse to testify so they end up being sent to prison okay uh, and that become they become known as the Hollywood 10 because there was really kind of loose evidence as to whether or not they really had any sort of communist ties or even if they had communist ties were they really breaking a, any laws when you have freedom of speech okay um, in Hollywood, there was a blacklist where people, if you had or were suspected of having communist ties, you would not get work, all right? No one's going to hire you. So this is the Hollywood 10, all right? Free the Hollywood 10, okay? Alger Hiss was one of the spies um, for the Soviet Union. We could not prove that he actually was a spy. It was mostly around the hysteria, but we convicted him of perjury, which means lying under oath, Okay. Um, and so he's going to be sent to jail, uh, prison. We suspect that he was spying for the Soviets. One spy we know for sure, his name was Julius Rosenberg, okay? Uh, he and his wife had minor Communist Party acti activities. They were part of the Communist Party. They were very poor during the Great Depression. Um, he actually was working in and kind of around near with people uh, with the atomic bomb. He got a basic drawing of the atomic bomb and parts of it, and he handed it off to a Soviet spy who then gave it to the Soviet um, uh, people. And so when they explode this bomb in 1949, you know, Americans are paranoid. And so, uh, so Julius Rosenberg is actually suspected and arrested of being a communist, okay? We also had uh, a physicist, Klaus Fuchs, admitting that he gave information about the United States, uh, the U.S. atomic bomb to the Soviets as well. Um, so we have spies among us that are willing to help. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg do get caught. Ethel really isn't involved. Um, her brother is the one who got caught and then implicated Julius was also a spy. So her brother was a spy and so uh, was her husband. Her brother said she was typing up the messages to send to the Soviets, which isn't true. Um, but nonetheless, they were actually sentenced and uh, put to death, all right? They were executed for giving away the atomic secrets because there could be millions of people who die in America because they gave the information away. And then, and then there was uh, Joseph McCarthy. He's a senator from Wisconsin. He's not very good at his job. He needs to win re-election. So one of his strategies is... He starts uh, attacking and suspecting that there's communists in the government, okay? He claims there's communists in the State Department, which is the department that kind of handles foreign affairs, handles things here at home. They're a major part of the federal government. And so he starts attacking and saying there's uh, 205 communists in the State Department. He has no evidence of this. And he's just attacking people and calling them communists. And when you do this, it's called McCarthyism. When you have no evidence and you're just blaming someone and accusing someone, it's called McCarthyism. Um, and so this is kind of a winning strategy for him. So everyone, no one's calling him out that he has no evidence. And then in February of 1950, he says he has this list of 205 people, of uh, communists who have infiltrated the State Department, but he has actually no evidence of this. Okay, nobody actually sees the list. Nobody does this. Then he takes it a little further and then accuses members of the U.S. Army of being uh, in there, and that really brings down public support. Uh, he's claiming that communists have taken over the United States military. Um, he's put on trial. He's badgering and bullying people, and people see that he has no evidence. Therefore, he has no real truth. He loses support and later leaves the election. So with Joseph McCarthy, you know, 
causing fear and panic. You know, that was really the 1950s and this Red Scare was a fear of communism. You act a certain way, you do a certain way because it was a fear that the communists were going to be taking over. All right, so this really infringes on our First Amendment ability.